Watch us tonight. I am your host, Tim Masso. We have a lot to cover. This evening, I window shop for my next watch. We talk about watches and crime. All of that, we chat live and I share your viewer wrist shots tonight on Watches Tonight. All right, Eddie Landsberg, Edward Ledden, Wachusiast from Dubai, Joe Pinto, Dave Opencar, Alex O, Sean H, and Richard Combs from South Florida joining us in the box. Remember to check out the redesigned homepage of thewatchbox.com. It is literally updated every hour or two. So if you checked it this morning, check it again. You just might find the watch you want. That's a bit of a throwback right there. Viewerist shots number one. I asked and you answered. Danny H opens with my favorite Patek Philippe, the 5235G in white gold, the annual calendar, the regulator, the grail. I love it. We've got Eric G of Dallas who takes a Bentley Bentayga drive through the city with his FP Journe Octa Sport purchased from the watch box. Thank you for trusting our company. We have Bob R who shares the H Moser and C Endeavor Center Seconds mosaic that he bought from Govberg. Thank you for trusting the other side of our company. Tim Q is in Brooklyn for the holiday with his Patek Philippe 5905P in platinum. Annual calendar flyback chronograph and I'm loving it. Mark K and his Patek Philippe Calatrava Pilot Travel Time, ride by Tesla Model 3 in Silicon Valley's metropolis of San Francisco. And we've got Kieran W. who receives his Grail watch, the white gold blue dial Rolex Daytona Estella the dog looks on in the background. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on these pixels. All right, let's see who's joining us in the box. Kieran's there, joining in from Ireland. We've got Bobby Smith, we've got Nicholas M, we've got Soma joining in. We've got Matt Foster, Bob Golub from Paris. We've got Samir from Marseille. We've got Joe Tyson from Apex, North Carolina, and Biohazer from Dublin, Ireland, M. Peters from the Netherlands. You guys staying up late with me in the Middle East and Europe, I really appreciate this. I think we've also got a few friends from Africa and South Africa, so everyone's staying up late. I appreciate it getting up early. I appreciate it all the same. Okay, watches and crime in 2022. This has become a big issue, and I see it more and more in mainstream media. So from time to time on this show, I've discussed crime involving watches. Sometimes it's big picture crime, like the Jacquet affair. Other times it's garden variety street crime. And what we're seeing now seems to fall somewhere in between the two, as there is some sort of degree of organization and maybe even gang involvement in certain circumstances. So let's talk about the moment of targeted watch thefts that appears to be upon us. Just this weekend, Watch Time Events, which is the Office of Watch Time Magazine that organizes Watch Time New York and LA, declared its May LA event to be postponed until further notice. I'm not giving up the game, this is on their website right now. And an email was sent to ticket holders, but no rationale was offered for the decision. A speculation points to elevated watch theft and targeted crime focusing on high value personal events effects. Now brands may have been reluctant to attend the watch time event and it's possible the concerns were voiced for the security of showgoers arriving and departing. I should mention that no such problems were cited and no incidents reported when I attended watch time New York last fall in October and all of the big names were there. We were coming and going from the show in Manhattan all day long and into the night. No one had any trouble in or around the show or on the city streets day or night. So all of this seems quite precipitous as we didn't have the problem on the right coast of the United States. But instances of watch theft in LA are easy to find these days and they tend to involve high value watches from very recognizable brands. And by this, I mean the thieves aren't striking randomly and hoping to find a Richard meal. Uh, they're looking for them and then stealing them. It's not uniquely a United States or local city problem either, since you can see the same trend now spanning several years in Holland, in Canada, the United Kingdom, and France. And that last image from Le Parisien was used by Gary G of Quill and Pad to illustrate in an article he wrote, and I definitely recommend the article, a spate of high value watch thefts in a short period in and around central Paris. And you can see these are all high value and name brand models within a very short period of time. All of which is to say these thefts were pre-planned. 
And the trend dates back years as this headline from 2017 and that headline from 2020 reveal. Although the exact relationship between the pandemic and elevated thefts remains debatable and debated, a certain kind of consensus is emerging that easy online sales of stolen goods help to sustain theft trends. Very few articles of high value are being stolen for personal use, which is to say, if South LA gangs are stealing high-end handbags, they are not themselves carrying those Louis Vuitton and Hermes handbags around South LA. All of this stuff is finding its way to the black market and a lot of folks really believe that is the pull that explains this rash of thefts around the world. At least at the retail level though, business leaders certainly see a link between easy anonymous online sales and thefts of luxury goods. While a stolen $500,000 Richard meal is unlikely to pop up on eBay or Facebook Marketplace or Amazon, lower value watch for more mainstream brands will be offered online through certain online sales platforms and marketplaces. Hope King, writing in Axios, describes U.S. legislation known as the Inform Act, and we've got a little bit of detail. You should check out the article. It's still valid. That was written in December of 2021, uh, which is designed to make online sellers recognizable and identifiable by name and contact, and it's supported by major retailers seeking stop-loss assistance. So this might be the break in the chain. So if you can take the online sales out of the equation, all of a sudden there may not be quite as big a market for targeted thefts. We shall see. This is a big problem that appears to be getting larger. What I can say is that even this has its limits, as many super high value watches, Patek Philippe, Richard Mille, Grubel Forsy, uh, won't come up for sale openly and obviously on major sales platforms. The Inform Act is more of your, your Rolexes, your Omegas, your Longines, your Breitling, and of course luxury goods like a electronics and articles of fashion that would be sold at retail locations. So, regardless of what kind of luxury watch you're wearing, use common sense. If you've heard of watch thefts in an area, don't wear a high value watch in that area. And as I always like to say, if you're in a city or a town or even a part of town that you don't know well, wear the G-Shock, the Swatch watch, the Apple watch. That's the time to wear something that won't break your heart if it gets stolen. Something you can afford to replace and something that doesn't of necessity involve some sort of insurance coverage. Remember, be smart when you're traveling. Be smart when you're out. Be smart in your neighborhood, in other neighborhoods. Be smart when you're dining outside. And of course, if you are going to a watch event like a Red Bar or a Watch Time or a Watches and Wonders, be smart about what you wear to and from the event. That's all I can really say, and it's unfortunate we need to have this discussion. Hopefully in the future, authorities, politicians, and the like will come up with some sort of solution. But in the short term, be your own stop loss and take precautions. All right, we've got Butik One joining in from Poland. We've got Paul Steinberg and Associates joining in. We've got Antelope, always great to make it live, best show on YouTube. Thank you for that. We've got Arto Charles from Manhattan, New York, St. Peter saying hi to Tim and to Sean, who's operating the switcher with the graphics. Joshua Ramirez, Terry C, Dan CT, hi Dan, good to see you. And John claude Beaver, we got Jeff G joining in from Boston and Jacob Olness from Montana. Will Charlesworth is staying up late in London with us. All right, viewer wrist shots number two, I asked you answer David F and his yellow Rolex Oyster Perpetual Stella Dial, Cruise in the Tesla Model Y, all electric, you've got a digital car and an analog watch. We've got Kunal M who flies from London to Mumbai. That is gonna be one hell of a flight, but he's in good company with his Patek Philippe Calatrava 5196. Justin Y and his Rolex Date 8 2 Roll, in a manner of speaking, with the Lexus IS350 Sport. You know I love my watches and wheels. Martin L of Switzerland shoots like a pro with a black and white shot of his new HMC, that is H Moser and C Venturer Vanta Black. Adam CJ and his BMW hit the streets of Seattle with proper motoring chronograph. Adam, I also loved the shot you sent with the Space Needle. Okay guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your analog or even your digital 
on my digital. Who's in the box? We got Jonathan Watts from India, Frankie C, Jabo Surf from Adelaide, Australia, Edward Ledden saying crime in some areas in Sweden has become really bad. So it is a global thing. You got to take care of these days. And we've got Yasis joining in from Adelaide. Thank you so much for getting up super early in the Pacific Rim to join me. Okay, so guys, I'm shopping for my first new watch in four years. It's an unaccustomed feeling. Quick rewind and then we'll fast forward. Back in 2018, I was preparing for the next chapter of my life. Those of you who follow me regularly know what I had in mind and it's still a bug in the back of my head, so never say never. And the watch episode back then, at least in my perception, was drawing to a close. I tried it in my JLC collection, yes, to raise funds for what comes next, but also to burn my ships because just as Cortez apocryphally burned his ships to motivate his men. I felt like selling off my collection, I sold it to Watchbox, was the best way to really focus on what comes next without splitting my attentions and my emotions. So I sold off my collection, but as I did so, I decided I should keep some kind of memento and last watch to remember my time with Watchbox and Watch You Want and my brief moment of celebrity as a minor figure in social media. And that watch that I chose was my Zinn EZM 1.1, the 500 piece limited edition that was a sort of modern update to a famous model from the 90s. Well, my Zinn is off to its new home. You probably know the story behind that, but I'm also committed to sticking with watches for the foreseeable future, which means I'm gonna be in this seat for a while. I'm excited to see how this company grows. Sean and the rest are coming along with us and it is going to be a thrilling period. But it also means that I'm in the watch market for the first time in four years, as I don't think I can justifiably be the person I am in this company and in the community and pretend that this is the only watch that makes my heart beat, or for that matter, race. So I need to have some sort of luxury watch, even if it's going to be my one and only like the Zen. I do need something else, and I'm currently looking around. Come window shop with me tonight. I'm reviewing these watches in order from feasible to fantasy, and here is a list of what I would love to own, why I chose them, and what the market looks like for each one on the list. So what you guys are saying, Jim Millet, still think the ceramic blanc pain bathyscaph should be on your short list, Tim. We got Jacob O saying the Mossograph is a goat. We've seen, we have Arca saying, consider a Polaris perpetual calendar, or maybe even the Memovox, as I love swimmable watches and I love alarms. And then we have Curtis Arndt joining in saying, hi everyone from the Marine Corps Air Station at Camp Pendleton. Thank you for your sacrifice and service, and thank you for joining us tonight. We got Scott Wexland saying, Tim, you want the Milgos, the Milgos, get it. The Milgos Z Blues, high on my list, but we'll talk about why that's not on the list tonight. We got Jonathan A saying, get an HYT, no one will know what it is. I'm actually considering that. The Steel H0 in black with green accents. John Claude Beaver saying, 5170G or P, you guys know I love the P. And then we have Booser asking, what the heck is he wearing right now, Swatch System 51 System Frog. Zeke asking, Tim is leaving Watchbox. No, in 2018, it looked like I was leaving Watchbox. I'm sticking around now. I'm actually, I'm in it for the long haul. They made the case and I'm convinced. And then right here, we've got Arca saying, I just got the Polaris Memovox and I'm totally in love with it. Wear it in good health. All right, let's start from the most practical and obtainable watch on my list and work our way up to the insanity that comes at the end. Starting with the Ball Engineer 2 Magneto S. Guys, I've mentioned this watch in the past, but for those those who might be new or need a refresher, here's what there is to say. Launched in 2015, this watch came from Ball, which does have roots in the American railroad industry, but this watch specifically is from a very different tradition. The tradition of the technicians and engineers watches of the 1950s, the Rolex Milgauss in its first two iterations, the Omega Railmaster, the Patek Philippe A Magnetic, and the Gégère Le Coult Geophysique, the IWC Ingenieur. This watch is in that tradition. It's 42 millimeters in stainless steel and it features several different refinements that I really value, starting with the COSC chronometer certification. It is 5000 G shock resistant thanks to a shrouding of the hairspring that Ball calls spring lock. It actually makes the watch profoundly more durable and 
accurate under rough handling conditions. It is anti-magnetic to over 80,000 ampere per meter or mil gauss and it is 100 meters water resistant. It also has a set of tritium tracers that is radioactively activated phosphorescence on the dial that is not dependent on sunlight exposure and if you put it in a box for a year and take it out at night it will still be glowing. Now this watch has an iris in mu metal as they call it which is a paramagnetic alloy. It closes over the display case back when you turn the bezel a little bit like the iris from Stargate if you guys remember Stargate. So it closes and shrouds the movement to protect it from magnetism and then it retracts so you can view the display back. Now there were two sub variants, the Valor and the Valor II, both of 399 pieces that honored respectively the end of World War II and 70 years of the US Air Force. So those are out there as variants. The watch cost $3,400 new, but it is sold out and Balls told me they do not intend to resume production. So I would have to go used and it would be roughly 2,500 to 3,000 used. And when you consider $3,000 for a used ball that cost 3,400, that's actually pretty impressive value retention, making this the leading candidate to find a place on my wrist. Now, Omega, you guys know I have my grandpa's retirement watch and my graduation watch. So in many regards, I am an Omega man already. Already. And having spoken to Robert Yan Brewer at Dubai Watch Week last fall, it was clear that he sees a heart and a soul inside of Omega with its historians, its heritage departments, its high horology atelier, and its dedication to its history and its collectors. And I like that because these are the kind of qualities you typically associate with smaller brands and independents. And I really like the fact that I can get all of that in Omega with a watch that is chronometer grade, beautifully made, incredibly durable, and serviceable with parts and tech support forever. So my first proposal is the Omega DeVille our vision annual calendar. Now longtime viewers will know how much I love this watch. The annual calendar came out in 2008 and the Our Vision, which has sapphire viewports in its case, came out in 2007. It was the launch platform for the 8500 family of coaxial calibers. So this is a watch that has a gorgeous dial. Those lovely tracks around the our indices uh, have sort of an art deco air about them and so does the case. This is a gorgeous watch and it's COSC certified. It has an anti-magnetic, basically a magnetic set of escapement and hairspring. It is an annual calendar with a month and a date, double quick set, and it only needs to be reset once a year during the jump from February to March. It is 100 meters water resistant, so though a little bit dressy, it is quite durable and a bracelet is available to make it more so. You can actually see this example I reviewed on the bracelet. Now in 2007, I was working my first job out of college and at the Tourneau above Penn Station, while I was waiting to take my train home to Long Island, I would check out the new models and I was very impressed by the hour vision. At the time when I was extremely impressionable and just getting into the watch hobby, this was a watch that made an impression and it left one. It's a watch that I still associate with everything that's cool and desirable and somewhat mysterious and alluring about luxury watches. And it's a profoundly practical 41 millimeter stainless steel watch. So I have those personal associations and I know for a fact it looks good on my wrist because I have reviewed several of them. I also remember taking chartered cars home from my company. Back at my first job, you could get a car home if you stayed past eight o'clock. And I would see the billboards for the Hour Vision, which back then was the new hotness. And again, I was very taken by it. All of which to say, this is a great candidate, but the bracelet's rare and it doesn't have loom. And I do like to have luminescence and easy water resistance where I don't have to swap out a strap or a band. Now the watch costs $10,600 new, but it no longer appears to be in production, which means I'm gonna have to look for something used and the used market is all over the place. Price-wise, somewhere between the $4,000 and $9,000 range. Don't know what's going on there, but there were only four on offer on Chrono. So it's a fairly rare watch for a mass-produced Omega. Speaking of which, the Omega Speedmaster Moon Watch Gray Side of the Moon is a timepiece that I've proposed as my next watch in the past. And it may be the leading candidate because it has something I 
prize above almost everything else, which is durability. The ceramic case, the sapphire crystal front and back makes this watch almost indelible. I have never seen a scratch on a gray side, a dark side, a white side, or a blue side. Those are all of your ceramic cased moon watches. Now this one came out in 2000 and 14, one year after the landmark dark side of the moon, and in many ways it was a more interesting watch. Still 44.25 millimeters, it's now in gray ceramic. It has a solid sandpaper-like platinum dial with smoked white gold hands and indices, and it is fully loomed, and by fully loomed, I mean the tachymeter and the crown insert in addition to the dial. It is nearly impervious to scratches, and because sapphire and ceramic is super light, not only is it light on the wrist, but at only 50 millimeters lug to lug, it actually fits pretty well. Now inside you get the chronograph version of Calibre 8500, the 9300, which is everything the hour vision was, automatic, chronometer, anti-magnetic, shock resistant, 60 hour power reserve, twin barrels, coaxial escapement, but you get a column wheel vertical clutch chronograph and you get that time zone function that allows you to set the hour hand independently as you travel. Now this watch is $12,000 new, but there are some deals to be found on used markets, potentially as low as $10,000 for a full set watch. And with a five year warranty, you could buy a two, three year old watch that still has substantial warranty. And these watches, 8500s, 9300s, and their later master chronometer equivalents are super accurate. I have found them to run within one second a day. They absolutely deliver on the promise of a chronometer certification and the Daniels escapement. Okay, let's see how many of you are watching. You got, we have 440 people watching this right now. Those are like watches and wonders and SIHH and Basel World numbers. Guys, thank you. We've got Rohit R saying gray side of the moon and Samir saying gray side is amazing. Right here we have Miguel saying Omega's annual calendar complication is seriously undervalued. I would love to see Omega feature it in something new and cool. Right here we have Arthur saying finally caught this live for once, loving it so far. And Eric Nielsen saying gray side is strong and it counts elapsed minutes and hours almost as intuitively as the EZM 1.1. That's true. It counts them on one register that cleans up the dial and also makes it easy to read. Jim Millett saying out of the three so far, the gray side would easily be the top of my list. And we've got Lazib saying gray side of the moon, but meteorite dial for me, please. I like that. We got waffle on watches saying find something that fits. For me, that was also a ball, but the engineer two Marvel light and one that's big and bold. And then we've got Gary K saying check the price tomorrow on each of your choices. I bet you can move the market. Do me a favor and show some love for, oh, which Panerai was it? Oh, the, the comment there, pa, for the PAM 321. That's one of the complications. All right, showing some love for the PAM 321. And jumping back to our regularly scheduled program with viewer wrist shots number three, Abdul R., my good friend in the German Black Forest, enjoys the German spring with his vintage Tudor Submariner. Colin B. forwards the case back of his grandfather's J.W. Benson retirement watch. Talai S. Of, Greenwich, of Greenwich, Connecticut, shares his Arushi Lacquered Seiko Presage SARW 13, looking good and I love the choice. Great family shot there. We got Terry C. celebrating his 50th birthday with his Zenith DeFi Skyline. Happy birthday, my man. Nicely shot, well worn, wear it in good health. And Lloyd Kane is Doxa Sub, visit the Clipper ship, Stad Amsterdam in Baltimore Harbor. And that is one good looking ship and watch. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. All right, shopping for my first watch in four years continued. You may ask, where's the Devon Tread, the Rolex Milgauss Z Blue, or the MIH watch that I've mentioned in the past? Well, for me, as much as I love the Devon Tread, I'm conflicted on a purely electronic watch from a relatively new brand. I would love to own one, and I think it's genuinely cool, but as big as it is, it seems a little bit more like a party watch, and I do wonder whether, in the long run, Scott Devon has interest in staying with the brand and staying with the watch project. So I would want to know that any watch I buy for $10,000 or more has a long-term service future. Hey, Scott, if you're out there, let me know. What are the plans for the long term? As far as the Rolex, for me, I just don't think I'm a Rolex guy. Uh, as much as I love the Z Blue, and it may yet be in my future, I just don't know if the brand baggage is something I can personally contend with. And this is a determination each of us has to make when considering
considering a Rolex, there is a lot that comes with owning a Rolex that's not pure fun and intrigue of owning something cool and well made. There is the other people factor and ah, frankly I just don't know that I'm at peace with that. Now, the MIH watch. Again, a watch I think is really neat, but what happens after Paul Gerber is done making watches? He built the watch, even though Christian Gaffner designed it and Ludwig Oxlin engineered the calendar. Paul Gerber's atelier was responsible for the construction and service of these watches, and I don't know what his attitude towards watchmaking and watch service is five, ten years down the line, and I'm looking at this watch as a long-term piece. Okay, all of that said, let's talk about some mid-priced options that I'm considering starting with a local boy and the RGM model 801 COE core of engineers. Now this watch is made out in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. RGM means Roland G. Murphy, the Wostep trained watchmaker who is the founder and still head of the company. This model, part of the 801 family of wristwatches, is based on vintage American watches made for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers during the World War I era. Now, 42 millimeters in stainless steel, it features a period-inspired, genuine fired enamel dial in vintage style. The Caliber 801, launched in 2008, lends its name to the new model, and this was the first all-new American watch movement since at least the 1970s. 70s and maybe even the 60s, but it's made entirely in Pennsylvania, and as you can see, it's a very traditional a pocket watch and desk clock layout, so it fits the image of the model. This watch has lots of loom, which is something I consider essential. Now, lots of options allow for customization beyond the $10,900 base price. So, Sean, if we can go full screen here so folks can see what I'm talking about, every option would be my option. I would go with the stop seconds, the wolf's tooth winding wheels, the full solid gold hand engraved black polished swan's neck regulator and balance bridge which you can see down in the lower right and I would go with the optional motor barrel which is a lovely mechanical engineering throwback to the days when a motor barrel was used to guard against drivetrain shock if a mainspring broke so I would be getting from I guess left to right and top to bottom on your screen one two four and six all of which would swell the price to $17,650. But again, this is handmade locally, supporting American manufacturing and getting a little piece of American watchmaking heritage for my wrist. Now, another watch of similar price, but probably much higher stature, both contemporary and historical, is the Blancpain 50 Fathoms. Blancpain is an awesome brand that is undervalued inside a Swatch Group. It's easy to forget just how good the 50 Fathoms is. And at 45 millimeters in titanium, this 2017 model with blue dial and bezel would be my choice. It's light on the wrist and it has real heritage to Rolex Submariner. Uh, it can rival the Rolex Submariner as the two came out in 1953, but the Blanc Pain came out earlier in 1953, so it was formally the first modern format dive watch before the more famous Rolex. It is a big watch at 45 millimeters, but it fits me decently at 50.6 millimeters lug to lug, and again, being all sapphire and titanium, it is super light on the wrist. Blancpain makes a wonderful watch with a sapphire capped 120 click bezel, 300 meter diving depth, and caliber 1315, which is a Blancpain exclusive movement, and it's gorgeous. Three day power, excuse me, three mainspring barrels, five day power reserve, super shock tolerant based on the ultra haute de gamme 13 RO manual wind movement. Free sprung, shock tolerant, anti-magnetic silicon hairspring, anti-magnetic escapement, and beautifully decorated with a lovely deep spiral graining across the bridge instead of Cote de Genève, and mile wide enclage that is some of the most attractive I found on any watch at any price. I really like the idea of a watch I can put down for a few days, pick up, and not have to rewind or reset. So a five day power reserve would be a first for me and a real luxury. These are $15,700 new. But there's money to be saved when buying used. As you can see, they start in the 12,000, 11,500 and up range, which means you can get a hell of a lot of watch 
which in my opinion is technically and aesthetically and finish-wise superior to the local rival from Audemars Piguet, which is the Royal Oak Offshore Diver. I think this is a better all-around watch on every single level. I wish I had a loom shot for you guys, but rest assured it is as good as it gets and downright blinding. You look at this thing wearing NVGs and you're going to need to blink a few times to regain your vision. Let's see what you guys are saying in the box. Joe Tyson saying he's a fan of the gray side of the moon. We've got Aaron G saying De Batoon has nothing on this. It's nice to see this Rolex. Um, hmm, okay. What Rolex are we talking about? Oh, there we go. We go. We're talking about the 50 Fathoms, which is the Rolex rival. Okay, Mark S saying, Tim, they are updating the 50 in 2023, 70 years, or are they updating the 50? Yes, I believe they are, and we've already seen the replacement model, at least from a distance. Uh, do a quick internet search and you'll get a look at it. Also, Peter C saying, the 50 Fathoms is on my list. Blanc Pain makes some of the best watches in the world. Not just the divers, the complications in the dress watches. Enamel, retrogrades, jump hours, tourbillon, carousel, perpetual calendars, annual calendars, innovative setting mechanisms to protect the calendars, they have it all. Check it out, you will not be disappointed. If you are burned out on mainstream luxury watches, check Blanc Pain, luxury, Dress and complications. All right, what is going on right here? We had a question for me about my favorite something. Uh, this moves so fast, it's hard to keep up. Adrian Burke, what's your timeline to make a decision, Tim? I would say weeks, not months. And then we have Bonk King. I love Resonance watches, and so do I. The one thing I don't love is that my favorite model, the Type 3, if you shake it violently enough, and I'm not talking like jackhammers or anvil slides, I'm talking really shaking your wrist, clapping at a stadium, um, applause, uh, waving your hand in the air because you're watching sports. The resonance time can move a little bit. A and that's not something I necessarily love. The Type 5 lets you lock the time in place. That's their dive watch. So you don't accidentally move the time and extend your dive. But the Type 3 does have a tendency to wander as you move your wrist around. And that's something I'm not sure I could coexist with. Wonder of Watches is joining us from Ireland. Thank you for staying up late with me. And Dan CT saying the Ball Hydrocarbon Original is like the Ball version of the 50 Fathoms. Yes, it is. And it is an awesome value. Guys, check that out. It came out in 2019. It's still probably the best dive watch you can buy for the money and quite a bit money more. Jacob O saying the Blanc Pain Le Mans Revive GMT is fantastic. That's true. Loomed, water resistant, automatic, alarm, and a GMT. It's got a lot going for it. And it's beautifully hand finished. All right, let's jump into viewer wrist shots number four. John F. and Phoebe the dog appreciate his Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter Tokyo 2020. Tarek H. is out for an Easter Sunday drive with his Moser Endeavor Perpetual. Jeb B. in his Zin UTC 856 experienced Lake Titicaca from the Peruvian side of the lake. We have Samir in the desert. Uh, this is actually the desert of Agafe, Morocco, where he was cut off from his net connection. So we sent this one a few days later. It is his home modified Seiko. Curtis A takes us home, not quite yet, but metaphorically, as he's our last wrist shot, with his vintage Rolex GMT and 1960 Austin Healey bug-eyed Sprite, which, as he noted, holds many, many pugs. All right, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your wrist on my list. Shopping for my first watch in four years, now we get into the realm of flights of fancy. Things that probably couldn't happen, but what if? So, Patek Philippe 5235G, the white gold regulator annual calendar. Previewed in 2011, it reached limited production in 2013. They had to stop production before resuming in 2015, and it was discontinued for the rose gold model of the same watch in 2019. All of which is to say, not so many were made. This is a watch that proved difficult to make. The components, which were derived from the advanced research series of silicon component watches. Uh, they were the escapement and the hairspring, and they proved 
to be a little bit more hand labor intensive than they were intended to be. That slowed down production, but the watch is all the more desirable for it because it is rare and innovative. It's 40.5 millimeters in diameter by 10 millimeters thick in white gold, and the case design is a tribute to the vintage reference 3448 and the 3450 perpetual calendars of the 20th century. It is an annual calendar, a regulator, and it has a unique movement. That is not the 240 micro rotor, guys. This was created just for the regulator series and adapted later for the perpetual inline. It is a beautiful movement that is broader and bigger than the 240 with a more graceful architecture of bridges. It has the advanced research tech so it's anti-magnetic and long-legged between services and it has a beautiful micro rotor solution to automatic winding that keeps the case back open and visible like a manual and the watch thin like a manual but with the convenience of an automatic something that's great to have with a calendar watch. It has a distinctive dial with a distinctive logo that is engraved into the the dial rather than printed and you can see that lovely steel like vertical satin finish a waterfall from top to bottom with two different colors of silver and blue on silver printing quite unlike any other Patek watch. It is of course anti-magnetic which I value since my laptop continuously magnetizes my watches and at $45,000 to $50,000 used it's actually a pretty honest price that's more than it's sold new for, but not that much more than its original 2013 retail price. And you can still get factory sealed watches, which means you can get close to new models at these prices. And after all, it does look great on my wrist as the thickness and the size are perfect. And you know I love calendar watches. It's demerits well to its deficit. It has no loom. It's not very water resistant. And I'll be perfectly honest, it is difficult to read even in broad daylight. But with a watch like this, you'll make the effort. I certainly would. Okay, upping the ante here from annual calendars to perpetual calendars. We have last year's gem, the Patek Philippe 5236P in platinum. 41.3 millimeters, now 11 millimeters thick. It is big for a Patek dress watch and broad and saucer-like on the wrist. It keeps the case design from the 5235 and much of the movement architecture, but this, which was my favorite watch of 2021, uses an inline perpetual calendar system based on 1950s and 60s Patek Philippe pocket watches that used this arrangement. You can see it's a double digit date as well, and it's an American style calendar with the day, the date, and the month inline as read from left to right. Now, the watch features a new movement that is based on the regulator's unique 31260. Jumping back and forth between them, you can see they're not identical, as there's a more pronounced finger-style train stepping down from the great wheel to the escapement. This is much like a vintage pocket watch, and you'll note the use of a platinum micro rotor rather than the 22 karat gold on the regulator. The platinum is a more efficient winder. This watch, using a perpetual calendar system, is more energy intensive, so it needs the platinum rotor, and it has a mainspring with 20% more force. All of this is critical, and it's critically gorgeous front and back. The dial is very 2022 as it is both blue and gradient fume, but you know what? That's a lovely combination. The hands, they are more readable, to be perfectly honest, than the regulator system on the annual calendar, and this is more at a glance recognizable. Everything about it speaks to delicacy of detail and balance. Within the gradient blue, you can see that same top to bottom satin metallic finish we saw on the regulator, and I'm loving it now. Okay, the reality check arrives with the price, which is 136,020 US dollars, and I can guarantee you I will get zero pricing accommodation from Brian Govberg over on the Govberg side of this company. That said, the open market is even more daunting, so maybe I'll have to pay Brian his price because these things get pricey when they're used. All right, where does the fantasy end? It ends with pugs. I have always kept pugs. And the reason I bring up pugs is so you can understand my attraction to the next watch and the final watch on my list. 
My boss called it the ugliest watch she has ever seen, and I'm not going to dispute that this is a very polarizing look. And it may not be classically beautiful, but then again, neither are pugs, and I adore those. I love pugs because of how they look, not in spite of how they look. And that's how I feel about the Debatoon DBD or the DB Digital. Based on the DBS, but with an inline calendar jump hour display. This is a timepiece that was built in vanishingly small quantities from 2006 to 2009 by Debatoon, which is my favorite watch brand. This watch fits me well, which I cannot say about the other two jumping time Debatoon watches I loved. The DB28 Digital, which is just too huge, and then the DB27 Polo. The Digital is 45, the Polo is 43. Both of them are surplus to my wrist as they simply overlap the edge and they look wacky and weird. The DBD fits and it's not that big. It, it looks bigger than it is, but it's the size of a pendant watch, which means it's a slight little thing on the wrist. The white gold DVD specifically that you see right there is my ultimate dream watch, a jump hour that includes a calendar with inline day, date, and month amid a dial side plate of nickel anthracite coated Cote de Genève stripes. The case back is fired blue titanium with a spherical moon phase that is one half blued steel, one half white palladium, and that moon phase display only needs to be adjusted once every 1,112 years. That is the definition of set it and forget it. The manual wind movement runs for five days between windings. The market, the price, who the hell knows? No one knows. These things hardly ever come up for sale or for auction. I've seen one in the eight years that I've been doing this, and it was the rose gold model, not the white gold one that I want. It's long gone and out of production. They discontinued this decades ago, and they rarely surface, but hey, I can dream. Guys, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Let me know in the comments below, what should my next watch be? Do you have a favorite from among the watches I discussed tonight, or should I be considering something I didn't even think of, something special that you might suggest to me as my next watch? Thanks so much to Sean for bearing with me on the graphics, and thanks to all of you for joining me. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.